Okay, so hey guys, uh, Greg, um, reporting about interception, which I'm going to try and short de- shorten down to intus for the purposes of this talk, because if I say interception enough times, I'm going to develop a stutter. Um, so uh, today we're going to talk about that. Um, our goals are going to be to talk about the appearance of intuses on uh, point of care ultrasound and to suggest a um, sort of scanning technique in terms of finding it. Um, we're going to review some of the literature that's out there surrounding uh, point of care ultrasound and interception, which is actually some of the better literature we have. Um, and then henceforth, we are going to refer to interception as intus. See, I didn't realize we would have someone from the uh, you know home of the actual English language here, but I figured henceforth is uh, quite appropriate for you because it's a, a term that uh, is a bit more fancy than I might otherwise use. Um, okay, so our little case today is one that's probably familiar to anyone who's you know seen a pediatric emergency patient. It's a seven-month-old little boy um, who's coming in with altered mental status uh, that occurred soon after he was feeding, has vomited once, depressed GCS, vital signs are stable, his abdominal exam, you wonder whether he's kind of grimacing a little bit, um, but you kind of look and wonder, well, none of this stuff really fits that interception triad, and yet I think all of us have probably seen somebody who presented with an interception just like this. Um, and so um, this is kind of your classic setup for a case where point-of-care ultrasound can quite be extremely helpful, where you can get to the diagnosis in a kid that probably could have a lot of other things, but could very well have an interception. Um, and get to that a lot sooner and kind of, you know, exclude a lot of the other weird and wonderful stuff that uh, may cause a seven-month-old to have a sudden change like this. But before we actually talk about, you know, what the deception looks like, we have to sort of talk about what normal looks like. So um, it's it's important that even most kids that come in and we have a high suspicion of interception will probably not have an interception. Like it's it's not that when you go looking for it, you're expecting to find it. Um, most of the kids you check out in any abdominal examination, even when you have a sort of high pretest probability, are probably going to be normal. So knowing what normal looks like as opposed to what abnormal looks like is actually kind of important. Um, I pulled this slide from one of Mark's old talks. I don't actually know what he was trying to say here, but I'm going to sort of uh, you know, sort of guess what he was trying to get at, which is that basically in the normal state of affairs, you've got a bunch of intestinal bowel that's all looped on top of each other, kind of like a big maze. I don't think the mole at the bottom of it was particularly important for this slide. The but appendix. That's the appendix. Okay, fair enough. Um, so, uh, but that's kind of what you're expecting to see in terms of if you were to draw out an anatomy picture of the guts. Um, what you're actually going to see, though, because of all the artifact, is something a lot less kind of um, clear. And this is basically a bunch of loops of bowel all stacked on top of each other, which you can't really tell in a nice noticeable way. Sometimes it's easier than other times, but you've got this air shadowing that comes in. You've got, you know, sort of scattered random coils of bowel that move around. So you never really get a clear sense of what the heck's going on. And to a certain extent, that's the normal, right? You're expecting to see kind of nothing of use. Um, as opposed to something where there is a bit of an abnormal feature. When when you start to see stuff, I actually start to think, okay, maybe there is something going on. It's kind of one of those things you develop over time as you start looking at the abdomen more and more. I feel like the more that I'm seeing, the more it kind of makes me think, why am I seeing so much going on here? Because I'm now getting acoustic windows presented through either solid uh, structures or fluid or other things that ultrasound can pass through as opposed to the normal state of affairs when you've got a very um, air-filled bowel that uh, doesn't allow much to pass through. So what's going on in this clip? Does anyone, something jump out at you? There's sort of this, uh, Right there in the center, what's all that kind of stuff? Normal, not normal. Probably just poop. So probably just some mixed fluid slash solid debris that's stuck. Small bowel, large bowel. I think probably small just because on the left side of the screen here, you're actually seeing all these air columns coming down. And that's more likely to be your ascending colon, whereas the stuff on the right plus it's the transverse colon might actually just be loops of small bowel. So nothing nothing that's unusual, but but stuff that you're just going to see um, with some regularity when you start looking at a lot of bowels uh, that doesn't actually um, 
mean that there's anything abnormal, though it does kind of jump out at you a little bit more. So um, I put this image up because this is something that will be kind of a, a hallmark thing to look for when you're thinking about its deception. This is actually the air shadowing you're going to see from the ascending colon, and it's kind of what you're looking for in a normal person. So as you um, we'll talk about sort of the technique in just a minute, but um, as you come up from the right lower quadrant where most people are going to start, you're actually going to start to see this pop out. As soon as, as, soon as you start seeing this appearance of this, this air shadowing down, you can feel a little bit more confident that you're now in the ascending colon because it's usually the first column of air you're going to enter. Um, and if you're seeing the ascending colon and it is the first column of air that you're entering, you can kind of then infer that there's actually nothing inside of that ascending colon, which is where an aleocolic interception is going to come. So it's a quite an important landmark to try and pick up on because it's it's actually going to give you that sense of normality. Um, this is a, um, uh, a little image which we we don't get to see a lot of in terms of uh, in a very definitive way, um, but if you can imagine with me, I'm going to try and zoom through my cursor up on the screen here. This is probably our terminal ileum, this little loop that comes in right here. And this is our ascending colon. And if you watch it carefully, you'll see that at some point that little loop kind of starts to become part of the other thing, right? So your um, terminal ileum is entering into your ascending colon. And if I sort of go to the next slide where I've sort of still imaged this, you can kind of see here's the point where Probably if, if you, and it's easier actually to see when you when you see the loop play through in terms of just your mind picking up on it. Um, but you can kind of see that there's this back wall that seems to be entering this part and then it gets lost as you actually enter the air column, um, ascending column, so you can't see through it anymore. Um, but that's probably where your terminal ileum is entering into your, uh, your ascending colon. So that's your ileocecal valve. Um, and so if you see that, that's pretty much ruling out an ileocolic interception. It doesn't mean you can't have small bowel, small bowel, or large bowel, large bowel, but it's taking out the vast majority of the, the ones that we actually worry about, of course. Um, so it's something that you can try and look for. It's not always easy to see because it does get to be a bit of a mess of lots of air and stuff. And, you know, if your terminal ileum has some air in it, you're not going to see its back wall. And so kind of telling where that is can be a bit of a challenge. But um, if you do see it, then it's, it's something that's quite helpful to kind of uh, guide you as to whether there is any deception going on. So quick tips um, for scanning the abdomen in a toddler because... Um, if anyone's examined a toddler in general, they'll know that the time is kind of of the essence and you're also often sweating bullets because this kid's screaming, parents are stressed, you know, they're moving a lot. And so while it seems very easy to kind of um, see an interception, um, when you're looking at an ultrasound image, um, the actual process of doing it can be quite challenging and can make you feel like you're a bit of a jerk because you're kind of pinning this kid down who's screaming at you and, you know, the parents don't know what the heck you're looking for and, it's, it's a bit of a process, but I will say that it's important to, to keep in mind that what you're trying to do is actually get to the diagnosis. Um, and so being kind of extra gentle with them is actually not in their best interest necessarily, right? So um, one of the big things when you're scanning the abdomen is that you want to put a lot of pressure on with the probe, or at least enough pressure that you can actually see the structures underlying because air is going to rise to the top. Um, typically, if you're lying supine, and so if you don't put much pressure on, you're not going to uh, blot out that air and be able to see any of the underlying structures. And so being mean for a good few seconds and pushing down on the abdomen to try and see the structures you want to see is actually a lot better than sort of dinking around for a couple minutes while the kid's screaming and fussing and not seeing anything at all. Um, the other thing that would be important is just to keep pressing the record button when you're going through um, because you don't know if there's going to be something that might pop out all of a sudden, especially when a kid's moving around like crazy. And then, you know, if you're going to do measurements of things like an interception, then do it afterwards because um, trying to do it at the time of is never going to be easy.